Hello ghosts and ghouls, welcome to another edition of Danica Raven's Bite Sized Horror. This week we're going to be reading The Frontier Guards by H. Russell Wakefield. If you're sitting comfortably we shall begin. What a charming little house, said Brinton as he was walking in from a round of golf at Ellsborough with Lander. Yes, from the outside, replied Lander. What's the matter with the inside? Esoteric plumbing? No, the uh, usual offices are neat, if not gaudy. Spengler would probably describe them as contemporary with the death of Lincoln, but it's not that. It's haunted. Is it? By Jove, said Brinton, gazing up at it. Fancy such a dear little Queen Anne piece, having such a nasty reputation. I see it's unoccupied. It usually is, replied Lander. Tell me about it. During dinner I will. But you seem to find something of interest about those windows there on the second floor. Brinton gazed up for a moment or two longer and then started to walk back in silence beside his host. In a few minutes, they reached Lander's cottage. It was rather more pretentious than that, an engaging two-storied structure added to a modernised, from time to time formerly known as the Old Vicarage and rechristened Lamers. Black and white and creeper lined with a trim little garden of rose trees and mellow turf, two fine limes and a great yew, impenetrable and secret. This little garden melted into an arable expanse and there was a lovely view over to some high Chiltern spurs. The whole place just suited Lander, who was or it might be more appropriate to say, wanted to be a novelist. A commonplace and ill-advised ambition. But he had money and could afford to wait. James Brinton, his guest for the week, was a very old friend and he occupied himself with a picture gallery in Mayfair. A very small gallery. One rather small room to be exact but he had admirable tastes and made it pay. Two hours later, they sat down to dinner. Now then, said Brunton, as Mrs. Dunkley brought in the soup, tell me about that house. Well, replied Lander, I have had, as you know, much more experience of such places than most people. And I consider Patillion the worst or best specimen I've heard or read or experienced. For one thing, it's a killer. The majority of haunted houses are harmless. The peculiar energy they have absorbed and radiate forth is not hostile to life, but in others, the radiation is malignant and fatal. Patillion has been rented five times in the last 12 years. In each case, the tenancy has been marked by a violent death within its walls. For my part, I have no two opinions concerning the morality of letting it at all. It should be razed to the ground. How long do its occupants stick it out as a rule? Six weeks is the record. And that was made by some people called Pendexter. That was three years ago. I knew Pendexter Pierre, and he was a courageous and determined person. His daughter was hurled down the stairs one night and killed. And I shall never forget the mingled fury and grief with which he told me about it. Previous to that, he had detected 18 different examples of psychic action, appearances and sounds, several definitely malignant. The family had not enjoyed one single day of freedom from abnormal phenomena. How long since it was last occupied? asked Brinton. 
It's been empty for a year and I'm inclined to think it will remain so. Anyone who comes down to look at it is given a pretty straight tip by one or other of us to keep away. Does it affect you violently? I've never set foot in it. What? You of all people. My dear Jim, for that very reason. When I first discovered that I was psychic, I felt flattered and anxious to experience all that I could. I soon changed my mind. I found I experienced quite enough without any need for making opportunities. I do to this day. Several times I've had a visitor in the study here after dinner. An uninvited guest. And it has always been so. I have many times heard and seen things which could not be explained in places with perfectly clean bills of psychic health and one never quite used to it. Terror may pass, but some distress of mind is invariable. Any person gifted or afflicted like myself will tell you the same. It seems to me sometimes as if I actually assist in invoking and materialising these appearances and that I help to establish a connection between them and the place I inhabit. That I am a most unpleasant kind of lightning conductor. Is there any possible explanation for that? Well, I have formed one, but it would take a rather long time to explain, and maybe quite frivolous. Anyhow, there has never been any need for me to visit such a place as Patillion, and I keep away from them if I can. Would you very much object to uh, going in for a minute or two? Why? Well, I have been bothered all my life about this business of ghosts. I've never seen one. In a sense, I don't believe in them. Yet, I'm convinced that you have known many. It is a maddening dualism of minds. I feel if I could just once come in contact with something of the kind, I should feel a sense of enormous relief. And you'd like me to conduct you over Patillion? Not if it would really upset you. It would be at your own risk, said Lander, smiling. I'll risk it. You mustn't imagine that you can go into a disturbed spot such as this and expect to see about ten ghosts in as many minutes. Even in the case of such a busy hive as Patillion, there are many quiet periods. Some people simply cannot see ghosts. The odds are very much against your desire being granted. Though, if you are psychic, the atmosphere of the place would affect you at once. How? Well, you've often heard of people who know by some obscure but infallible instinct that there's a cat in the room. Just so. However, I'll certainly give you the chance. It won't seriously disturb me. I can get the key in the morning from the woman who looks after it, though I need hardly say she doesn't sleep there. There is no need for a caretaker. It was broken into once, but the burglar was found dead in the dining room. And since then, the crooks have given it a wide berth. Is it really dangerous then? Beginning to feel a bit prudent? No, I shall feel safe with you. Very well then, after coming back from golf, we'll pay it a visit. It'll be dark by five. We'll make the excursion about six. The chances of gratifying your curiosity will be better after dark. I'd better tell you something else. I never quite know how these places are going to affect me. Before now, I've gone off into a kind of trance and been decidedly weird. My dear Jim, my sense of time and space becomes distorted. Though for your assurance, I must say, he added smiling, I'm never dangerous when in this condition. Furthermore, you must be prepared to make an acquaintance with a mode of existence in which the ordinary laws of existence, which you've always known, abdicate themselves. Bierce called his famous book of ghost stories can these things be? 
assuredly they can. Now, I'm sounding pompous and pontifical, but some such warning is necessary. When I touch that front door tomorrow, I may become, in a sense, a stranger to you. Once inside, we shall cross a frontier into a region with its own laws of time and space and where the seemingly impossible can happen. Do you understand what I mean and still want to go on? Yes, replied Brunton, to all of your questions. Very well then, said Lander. I will now get out to the chessmen and discover a complete answer to Retty's opening, which you sprang on me last night. So you shall have the white pieces. November 21st was a lazy, drowsy, cloudless day, starting with a sharp ground frost, which thawing unresistingly as the sun climbed, made the trees at Ellensboro like tiny slides. In consequence, neither Brynden nor Lander played very good golf. This upset Brynden not at all, for he was thinking much more of that which was beginning to impress him as a possible ordeal. The crossing of the threshold at Patillion was only a few hours away. As they finished their second round, a mist spreading like a gigantic spider's web was beginning to raise the level of the Buckinghamshire fields. As they walked homewards, it climbed with them, keeping pace with them like a dog sometimes hurrying ahead, then dropping back, but always with them. It was exactly five o'clock as they reached Le Mears. Tea was ready. Do you still want to go, Jim? asked Lander abruptly. Sure do, replied Brynden lightly. Here's the key, said Lander, smiling. The open sesame to the Chamber of Horrors. The electric light is turned off, so all the light that we shall have will be produced by my torch. One last word of advice. If you want to get the best chance for thrill, try to keep your mind quite empty. Don't talk as I personally conduct this tour. Concentrate on not concentrating. I understand what you mean, said Brynden. Well then, let's get a move on, said Lander. An idea suddenly occurred to Brunton. How will you be able to show me over it if you've never been inside it? You needn't worry about that, replied Lander. The fog was thick now, and they wavered slightly as they groped their way down the lane, compressed by high hedges which led to Patillion. When they reached it, Brunton's eyes turned up to observe the windows on the second floor. And then Lander, stepping forward, placed the key in the lock. As the door swung open, the fog, which seemed to have been crouching at his heels, leapt forward and entered with him and inundated the passage down which he moved. The moment he was inside, something advanced to meet him. He opened a door on the left of the passage and flashed his torch around it. The fog was in there too. Jim, he could feel at his elbow, this is where they found the burglar. It's the dining room. His voice was not quite under control. Quite a pleasant room. <laughs> Smells a bit frosty. The little beam wandered from the chair to the desk, settling for a moment here and there. Then he shut the door and stepped along the passage till the little beam revealed a flight of stairs, which he began to climb. He still heard Brynden's steps coming up behind him. Up on the first floor, he opened another door. This is the drawing room, he said. The proctor's cook was found dead here in 1921. Round swung the tiny beam, fastening on chairs, tables, desks, curtains. He shut the door and began to climb another flight of stairs. He could hear Jim's feet pattering up behind him. On the second floor, he opened another door. This, my dear Jim, is the nasty one. It was from here Amy Pendexter fell and broke her neck. 
His voice had risen slightly and he was speaking quickly. Once again, he flashed his torch over the chairs, tables, curtains and ahead. Well, Jim, do you get any reaction, do you? You can speak now. As there was no answer, he turned and swung the beam of his torch on the person just behind him. But it wasn't Brinton who was standing there at his elbow. What's the matter, Willie? asked Brinton. Can't you find the keyhole? The figure in front of him remained motionless. I said, can't you find the keyhole? asked Brinton more urgently. As the figure still remained motionless, Jim Brinton lit a match and peered forward. Then he reeled back. Who in God's name are you? He cried. I do love a good haunted house story. If you've ever had a spooky encounter in one of your homes, why not tell me about it in the comments? If you enjoyed the show, why not like, comment and subscribe?